And today we are getting very specific. We're talking about the absolute core life-saving principles you need when managing severe chest trauma. Yeah, this isn't about the drama. This is about the system. Exactly. Okay, let's start the clock. Primary survey, patient with severe chest trauma. What is the single most immediate threat we have to find and fix? It is, and always has been, tension pneumothorax. It is the king of lethal chest injuries simply because of how fast it happens. Walk us through that mechanism. And really, let's emphasize the circulatory collapse part. This isn't just about a lung going down. No, not at all. So the injury, it acts like a one-way valve. Air gets into the chest space when the patient breathes in. But it can't get out. It can't escape. So that trapped air builds pressure. It doesn't just collapse the lung on that side. It physically shoves the entire center of the chest, the mediastinum, over. And that's the real catastrophe. That's it. That shift kinks the great vessels specifically the vena cava. When that's compressed, blood can't get back to the heart. So you get instant catastrophic obstructive shock. So here's that counterintuitive principle. Can we wait for a portable x-ray or a bedside ultrasound to be sure? Absolutely not. Waiting for an image is probably the most dangerous mistake you can make. The patient will die on the table. They'll die on the x-ray table or while you're getting the ultrasound ready. The rule is this. Tension pneumothorax is a clinical diagnosis, period. Made at the bedside. At the bedside, with your hands and your stethoscope. Okay, so what are the specific signs that justify immediate decompression? What do we need to see? You're really looking for two main things. Mm. First, absent or at least very decreased breath sounds on one side. In the second. Second, and this is the most important, is evidence of that obstructive shock. We're talking dangerously low blood pressure, hypotension that isn't getting better with fluids. A lot of people are taught to look for tracheal deviation. Is that a good early sign? It's a late sign, a very late, unreliable sign. If you can see the trachea has moved, you are way, way behind the clock. So don't wait for it. Don't wait. Focus on the low blood pressure and the absent breath sounds. The treatment is immediate. Needle decompression, finger thoracostomy, whatever you're trained to do, you do not delay to get an image. That distinction is so important. Clinical diagnosis over imaging. Okay. Let's pivot to a dangerous irony, the intubation paradox. Mm. We put it in a breathing tube to save a life, but can that very action turn a stable patient into a dying one? It absolutely can. Intubation and positive pressure ventilation are uh, extremely high risk in a chest trauma patient with a potential pneumothorax. So explain that transformation. You might have a patient with a simple pneumothorax. Bad, but not immediately fatal. Right, a simple air leak. The patient is still breathing on their own. They're compensating. But the moment you put that tube in and start forcing air in with a ventilator... You're driving air through that hole in the lung. You're actively creating the problem. You use the ventilator to force air into that pleural space so much faster than it could ever leak on its own. You have just converted a simple pneumothorax into a full-blown tension pneumothorax. You've created the one-way valve effect with the machine? You have. So since intubation is often unavoidable, how do you manage that risk right after you place the tube? Constant reassessment. It's mandatory. The whole team has to expect this to happen. So what's the protocol? The protocol is clear. Anytime a patient gets worse, especially right after an intervention like intubation, you go back to square one. Repeat the primary survey immediately. Assume the intervention caused the problem. You have to. So if that blood pressure tanks right after you intubate, your first thought is not, let's tweak the vent. It's Check the chest. Auscultate immediately. Immediately. If the breath sounds are gone on one side, you decompress. No hesitation. You fix the catastrophic mechanical problem first. Let's shift to anatomy. The deadly anatomy of the cardiac box. In penetrating trauma, speed is everything. What is the cardiac box? It's a simple landmark. A high yield zone on the chest that should immediately make you suspect a catastrophic injury. And its boundaries. The area between the nipple lines, basically. From the sternal notch at the top down to the costal margins at the bottom. It's a very tight defined space. Some call it the zone of maximum lethality. So what does a penetrating wound inside that box automatically mean for the trauma team? It means you have to assume the heart or the great vessels have been hit. Your first move is an aggressive evaluation, usually starting with a fast exam to look for blood around the heart. And you're looking for cardiac tamponade. Exactly. Which causes the same kind of obstructive shock as a tension pneumothorax. The location of the wound dictates everything you do next. Does that change if it's a gunshot wound versus a stab wound? Oh, yes. Massively. 
For gunshot wounds, that high suspicion zone expands. It becomes the entire front and back of the thorax. Why the whole area? Because a bullet's path is totally unpredictable. It can tumble, it can ricochet off bones. You have to assume the worst, that the heart, lungs, and great vessels are all in play, no matter where the entry hole is. Okay, let's build on that with our next point. This idea of navigating shifting anatomy. Mm. Why can't we just treat anatomy like it's a static picture in a textbook? Because it's not. The body's internal landscape shifts. It moves based on physiology, on a patient's condition. And if you misinterpret that, you can put a life-saving device in a lethal spot. Give us the classic example, the diaphragm. How high can the abdomen actually go? The diaphragm is incredibly mobile. With a deep, forced exhale, it can rise all the way up to the level of the nipple line, the fourth intercostal space. It's surprisingly high. It is. And it means that any penetrating wound below the nipple line, you have to assume it also entered the abdomen. So a lower chest stab wound could actually be a liver or a spleen injury. Exactly. You could be so focused on the chest that you completely miss a massive intra-abdominal hemorrhage. That's why any penetrating injury in that zone has to be evaluated for both thoracic and abdominal damage. How does this apply to a very specific patient population, say a patient in late term pregnancy? Great question. The gravid uterus shoves the diaphragm upwards by as much as four centimeters. Four centimeters is a huge difference. It's a huge difference. It compresses the lungs so there's less reserve, but it also means you have to change your procedure for placing a chest tube. Where do you put it? You have to go higher. You can't use the standard fourth or fifth intercostal space. You might end up in the abdomen. You have to move up to the second or third intercostal space to be safe. That kind of adaptive knowledge is what saves lives. Okay, our last concept. Let's talk about kids. The child's paradox. How does a child's pliable anatomy create a dangerous clinical trap? A child's skeleton isn't fully calcified. It's much more elastic, much more pliable than an adult's rib cage. So it bends instead of breaking. Exactly. And that flexibility allows their chest wall to absorb a tremendous amount of blunt force. They can get severe, even life-threatening pulmonary contusions, so bruised lungs without a single fractured rib. And that's the paradox. An adult would have a chest full of fractures, but the child's x-ray can look fine. It can look deceptively clear. And that's the trap. A clinician sees no fractures and gets this false sense of reassurance. They might totally underestimate the severe lung injury underneath. So if the imaging is misleading, what do you base your assessment on? The mechanism of injury. It has to be the primary guide, more so than the imaging. If the child was in a high-speed car crash or had a major fall, you have to assume there's massive underlying damage, even with a clear x-ray. So you treat the mechanism, not the film. You treat the mechanism. On the flip side, what does it mean if you do see rib fractures in a child? It means an incredible amount of energy was transferred to that child. The force needed to actually break those pliable bones is immense. So it's a sign of a much more severe injury. It demands immediate high suspicion for severe damage to the heart, the lungs, the great vessels. The injury is always worse than it looks on that first film. It's clear that effective trauma care is all about this deep, principled understanding. It's not just following steps, it's knowing the why behind them. It really is. And standardized programs embed this way of thinking. They give clinicians everywhere that shared foundation so you can function under the most intense pressure. So we've covered acting on clinical signs over waiting for imaging, the dangers of positive pressure ventilation, using the cardiac box as a mental shortcut. And how anatomy shifts, like that four centimeter change in pregnancy. And finally, overcoming that false reassurance from a clear chest x-ray in a severely injured child. These principles are designed to work anywhere. In a big trauma center or in a resource limited setting, the logic is the same. Right, so here is a final thought for you to take away. Think about all the technology you rely on every day. CT scanners, monitors, ultrasound. All of it. Now, what if it was all gone? What if you had to rely only on your hands, your stethoscope, and your knowledge? How would these treat first clinical diagnosis principles change your decision making in the first five minutes of the next major trauma you see? <sighs> Think about applying suspicion over certainty when the clock is ticking and you have nothing else.